I find it very interesting, and I suspect there's quite a lot to learn. I'm going to let Peter do his own introduction, but I should tell you that Peter is now the um, Deputy Vice Chairman, a uh, Deputy Vice President, not Chairman, Deputy I'll Vice President of IIMS, and he will be taking up that honour in about three years' time, 2022, 23, is it? I lose Anyway, so very happy, and uh, thank you for being with us today, Peter. So without further ado, I'm going to give you that. You need to find somewhere to put that. And Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks for the introduction, Mike. Um, I recognise a few faces here. Um, I've been a member of IMS since 1999, so one of the older, longer standing members, I should say. Not older, we've got some older members, gentlemen. Um, so I've been uh, in shipbuilding since 2002. Um, I first went out to Japan and then Korea, and since then I've principally build, been building LNGs. Uh, this is a quite a lengthy presentation, so I'm going to skip quite a few of the slides. It actually lasts about an hour. Um, some of them I will go through fairly quickly, but I'm very happy to take questions at the end. So um, I'm, this is assuming, basically starting from a point where uh, I assume the audience doesn't know anything about LNG, so I apologize if uh, I'm telling you something you already know. This is uh, the contents which you can read for yourself. I'm not one for reading out slides. I, I realize that you can read. <coughs> um, so we'll go straight into it. Um, what is LNG? Uh, it's a hydrocarbon, CH4, mainly methane. When we talk about LNG, we talk mainly about methane. That's the uh, molecular bonding. The interesting thing, um, we carry LNG in the liquid state for the very reason that it takes up 600 times less volume. So in the gaseous state, it expands 600 times. Hence, we don't carry it in the gaseous state. Um, the challenge of carrying it in the liquid state is that it is minus 162 degrees C. So it is cryogenic. Um, so this is a challenge of how we carry liquefied LNG in a steel ship, because steel tends to crack at anything below minus 30. So we'll go into the details of containment. Um, it's uh, 2.4 times the energy, um, normal compressed gas, so uh, your town gas, and 60% more energy than diesel, which means the calorific value is higher than a, than a liquid fuel. Uh, this is some of the, uh, the basic makeup of LNG. Uh, you see, if you take LNG medium as the uh, general makeup, the average makeup, it varies from depending on where it's extracted from around the world. It's like crude oils. You get sour crudes and you get high quality crudes. Gas is the same, depending on what field it's coming from. So really what we're interested in is the, the main part is the methane. So you can see the difference in the methane percentage uh, from 98 to 87, and that obviously impacts on its value. So um, <clears throat> depending on what field it's coming from, it, uh, it depends on the charter rate as well, who, who's, who's buying it. And this is a commodity. It is bought and sold as a commodity, can be. So we look at the supply chain, um, how we take it from the producing areas to the market. Um, just for those of you who are into a lot of jargon, and I don't understand a lot of jargon, I try not to use jargon, but there is a lot of abbreviations. FLNG is a floating liquefied natural gas vessel. Um, may or may not be self-propelled. Could be a storage unit. Um, FPSO is a loading and storage offloading platform. Uh, FSRU has a regasification plant on it. Again, it could be self-propelling or it could be uh, a barge. FSU, FSO, floating storage unit, 
um, that is oil only, not related to gas. All these things have FFF in front of them. They are not LNG. We're talking about LNGCs, liquefied natural gas carriers, ships. Um, this is quite a good image, just to give you a little bit of size and, and uh, perspective. The prelude uh, delivered out of Samsung um, about 20 months ago. She's now situated off the Northwest Shelf, uh, North West Australia, um, a long, long way off Perth. Um, she is uh, a floating production platform. So she's extracting uh, the gas from the seabed. So they have the wellheads on the seabed and then they have an umbilical. She's situated in over 2,000 meters of water. So she's off the continental shelf. So some other vessel has gone there and drilled the well and capped it. And then she's come along as the storage um, unit. So she's not just extracting LNG, she's got other gases and other nasty things that come off as well, but principally LNG. So she, is a, she's, she has uh, 28 LNG storage tanks, which is all this cryogenic. So she's taking off the gas from the field in a gaseous form. So a lot of the plant you see on the top sides is re-liquefaction plant. We don't want to store gas because it's 600 times the volume. So they have to re-liquefy it on board and store it in the hull. Basically the hull is a tank farm. And then they need LNGCs, liquefied natural gas carriers, like the one alongside. This is a MOS type, the domes are the MOS type, to come and take the gas from the field to the market. Just an example of something that's very current. So this is the kind of image and what we like to say is that LNG ships are what we call floating pipelines. It's rather a nice image. We have the production field and we have the consumer and the bit in the middle is a series of ships. It's not just one ship, one ship. It's a number of vessels going from the production field to the consumer. And there's normally several of them doing this. So it's quite a nice image that we call it a floating pipeline. We don't have a physical pipeline or a virtual pipeline. Um, these are the production areas and the consumers. This is a little bit old. Um, America has changed dramatically in recent years because of shale gas, hence the checkerboard approach. They used to be a massive importer. They were a massive importer before. And in, in my uh, time that I've been involved in LNG market. Um, they were incredibly scared of LNG. They didn't like LNG vessels to come into their waters. So they actually produced receiving terminals in the Gulf of Mexico and in Canada and hard piped the gas into America because they didn't want LNG vessels in their waters. My God, it's a bomb. It's very dangerous. It's a terrorist threat. Now you can actually sail up the Hudson in an LNG ship with a police escort, lots of lights and flashing and blah, 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 and very scared of terrorism and all these things. But actually, um, it's rubbish because they're very safe. So that's the American, sorry, no Americans. No, no Americans online. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sir. It's true, it's absolutely true. But they've, they, they've changed the dynamics a lot. Um, and they are still a big, a big consumer, but obviously a lot is coming from shale gas now. Uh, and Mr. Trump has changed the dynamics of that a lot. So. Anyway, um, Australia, you can see in the checkerboard down at the bottom here, um, they're, a, they're a big consumer, but they're also a big producer as well. Uh, the evolving markets tend to be the poorer countries, nothing wrong with saying that. Um, it's a very easy, it's a very good clean energy. It doesn't need refining. That's the wonderful thing about LNG. You just get it to the consumer in liquid state and they can use it. They just need a tank farm to contain it and it can, go, it can be used as a clean fuel. So it's a very efficient fuel. We'll come on to a bit more of that later on. Um, this is another little project which I've been involved with. These are ARC-7 ICE class 
ice-breaking LNG vessels. If anybody knows what ARC-7 is, it means that they have an ice-breaking capability and they have an ice belt around the, uh, the sea belt of steel about this thick, high tensile steel. Um, a normal LNG costs around $250 million per vessel. Um, these, Yamal just, or this is government, Russian government, Yamal or just as a for, first order, um, sorry, I keep moving out the camera, um, ordered 14 of these. Um, they start at $800 million a vessel. Um, but there's a lot of, uh, lot of gas up there. And um, it's Siberia, by the way, uh, if you want to go and visit. Um, they didn't really want to hard pipe it across Russia and then down across Europe. So the concept of this floating pipeline, I think it's a very nice visual image, is that they have the ice class vessels, which are not high speed, seaworthy vessels to use for uh, international trade, but they have these vessels which can go into Yamal, break the ice all year round, extract the gas in a LNG vessel, and then they come down kind of off Norway area, and then they transship them, they do ship to ship transfer to a regular LNG vessel, which then goes into global export. Could go anywhere. The first one went into Milford Haven. The first extraction from Yal Yamal was transshipped into um, a Chandris uh, LNG vessel, which I built single-handedly, and um, was delivered to Milford, which was rather nice. Um, this is one of those. I said 400. They actually they started at 400 million, but they just very very expensive vessels. Uh, just to put it into perspective, uh, FPSO starts at $800 million. So you're talking offshore price of a vessel per hull. So you can see it's a double-ended vessel. She has an ice-breaking bow, um, but she has four azipods, and she's actually goes through the, uh, she can go through um, five-year thick ice um, going astern. She has an ice-breaking stern, very slowly, but anyway. So that was quite an interesting project, and they're still building more. There's a lot of, uh, it's a consortium, they've got Sovconflot, and they've got a lot of people involved. TK, BP, there's a, it's a joint venture. Um, <clears throat> so the blue lines you can see are um, the continental pipelines, hard pipelines, and the yellow are uh, current shipping routes. Um, oh, sorry, possible shipping routes. The gray ones are current shipping routes. Uh, this is a couple of years old now, so I would say most of those yellow lines are, are now uh, current LNG shipping routes. Um, this is to show the extent of the current LNG fleet, global LNG fleet. There are around about 420 something uh, current LNG vessels in the market. An LNG vessel is built for uh, 40 years winter North Atlantic uh, use. We build the hull for that type of stress. Um, the hull, this is principally for the containment, the LNG containment and the stress analysis that goes into the LNG containment. Um, the hulls may not last 40 years. There's still some very old vessels around. But the point is that the, the containment system will last. The propulsion system won't last 40 years, but we can always re-engine them, or we can use them, always use them as storage facilities later on. So the... Oh. Oh. That's illuminating. Thank you. you. Should pay your gas bill. Um... So yeah, the containment system is designed, the stress analysis and everything that goes into it. It doesn't matter what type of LNG it is. We'll comment there's three principal types of LNG. So at the moment, there's around about 420 vessels. And you can see that the, the darker green part is the projection of the number of vessels that are required, taking us through to 2025 and beyond with the current world demand and the current availability of uh, natural resources, LNG. Um, you may have heard in the press recently that uh, Katagas is, uh, going to, is ordering 100 ships. It's the biggest shipbuilding order ever. The last biggest shipbuilding order was Katagas. 
in 2008, they ordered 40 ships. Uh, it's a natural resource of Qatar. They're very sneaky. The gas reserve is underneath Qatar, but it extends into underneath Iran. But Iran is not allowed to extract it. So <coughs> Qatar is making the most of this. And suddenly we need 100 ships to take it out as quickly as possible. So that's an interesting project. They will be cutting steel in 2022 um, for their first 60 vessels. So there we go. I put it at the bottom, 100 now. Um, this is the latest slide. Um, I, all of this information on these slides is in the public domain. It's, it's not all mine. It's not come from my head. Um, you'll see that I've uh, provided the data source for all of the slides. I'm not plagiarizing. I'm letting you know where it's coming from. Um, but Shell do a very good uh, annual report. Um, and this is from their latest annual report, the 2018 um, end of year annual report. I think the figures are staggering. The first one, uh, LNG trade reached 319 million tons. This is with the current export from uh, provider to, to user, consumer. Um, the thing that's impressive, I think, in the middle one, that China has changed its philosophy. They were a big coal burning country and very heavy in the um, diesel and, and so on and so forth. So you can see this, this is China, economic and environmental benefits of LNG, road transport, 6.7 million tons of LNG has been used in China roads, which is fantastic. And then on the same vein, this bottom slide, little corner here, coal to gas has been switched to 78% improvement in Beijing's winter air quality in the past five years. So LNG is, LNG in itself is a greenhouse gas. So we don't like releasing LNG. It's actually illegal to vent LNG uh, unless it's an absolute emergency. But the byproduct of burning LNG is H2O. So it's a no brainer, isn't it? There's no carbon in it. There's no carbon. When you burn LNG, there's no carbon, just vapor. So this is, it, it speaks for itself really. Um, the new thing, which I hope we're all getting into, we all be very aware of, is LNG bunkering. Um, there physically aren't enough bunker vessels in the world now for the future demands. Um, I think the very last slide shows that, of course, we are now LNG fueling VLCCs, LNG fueled passenger vessels, ferries, container ships. Where do they get their LNG from? There, isn't, there aren't enough bunker stations in the world to supply LNG. So this is the current market trend is a huge acceleration in, in bunker vessels. I'll come on to a bit more of that later. Okay, that's a blank. Why is that blank? That's for me to have a drink. Here we are. So just to give you a little bit about, I, I, you saw the graph there, the current number of vessels around about 420 in the global market. Um, this is what I'm into, um, building the current trend of whoever wants to employ me to build some more. So 37 vessels um, delivered in 2018. These are principally uh, Korean shipyards, Hyundai, Samsung, and DSME. A few ships were delivered in China, but they're principally for the home market, so not really for international trade. Um, currently, there are 36 vessels. If you consider... It takes 18 months to build an LNG ship from steel cutting delivery. Sometimes we're now down to 16 months in DSME in Daewoo. Um, and the investment in a single hull is $210 million. Um, across three yards, three shipyards in Korea, 36 vessels. So it's around about 12 vessels a year delivered from each of the major yards. Um, the figures do include FLNGs, which we remember on test you. Do you remember what FLNG is? It was at the beginning. Very good. All right. And the FSRUs. Um, so that's kind of skewed the figures a little bit. Uh, these two, the FLNG and the FSRU, are kind of considered to be offshore projects, whereas the LNGs are considered to be commercial vessels. Um, there was a big downturn in the offshore market, as you know, the oil crash and everything like that. And there were some um, FPSOs and things like that, which were 
um, very late in the building stages. They were delayed in, in building and the owners just didn't take delivery. So there's quite a backlog in these. So the, these 12 are probably legacy vessels which were ordered maybe four or five years ago. Um, most of the vessels built in South Korea. There are a few in Japan, mainly for the home market. Japanese vessels are still very expensive. Um, build quality in Japan is fantastic. Um, the price of steel and the price of labor in Japan is very high. So not many foreigners, foreign companies buy or build in Japan anymore. Um, the Chinese market, again, is normally for owners who are joint ventures in China with Chinese firms. Um, the Chinese are, to some extent, able to build LNGs now, but the quality, um, and they're almost twice as expensive and they take twice as long to build. So. It's, uh, if, you need to, if you were to build an LNG in China, you'd have to have three times the time, size of site team to supervise the ship, to teach the shipyard how to do it. Anyway, um, order book at the moment is 18 vessels. This is for, principally for the Korean yards. 18 vessels for 2020. Uh, there's a bit of a hiccup because uh, Hyundai is buying, no, Hyundai is taking over the SME. The government said, make it happen. So they are. Um, the next uh, nine, 10 months is a consultation period. Um, Hyundai is, it's not a consultation period at all. It means that HHI can just walk into the SME, see what they like, decide what it's worth and get rid of the stuff that they don't want. So um, the order book is a little bit low at the moment because all owners are holding off making orders. However, if you're really interested in buying an LNG, there will be a serious discount at the uh, quarter four of the end of this year because the order book won't be full and they want to sell the orders, the slots. So um, now it would be a good time to get some equity funding. Um, Catagas will be going forward with 60 ships for the first building uh, trench. And that will be 20, 20 ships in HHI, 20 ships in SHI, 20 ships in DSME, or whatever DSME will be called by 2022, because it will be part of HHI by that stage. Um, Shell and Exxon are also very much in the market, but probably will be part of the Catagas consortium and probably will be um, the charterers for Catagas. So, um, LNG types, I uh, apologize if um, I'm telling you something you already know. Three principal types of LNG uh, containment, all based on the almost uh, the, the, the principle is to carry a cargo of an LNG. The vessels I'm building at the moment are 180,000 cubic meters. So we call them 180K vessels. Uh, the trend has gone up. We were building 170K vessels five years ago, but obviously if you carry a bigger package, it's more cost effective. So if you can carry 180,000 cubes, it's more cost effective than just carrying 170,000 cubes. They're physically bigger ships, um, but the principles are that we take on board our liquefied natural gas and we should only have a 0.15% uh, uh, boil off rate, which means that the quality and the efficiency of the insulation, natural insulation, not anything, no mechanical reliquification, purely an insulated box, cargo hold, cargo tank, containing a liquid, should not uh, allow more than 0.15 boil off by volume per day. Um, and of course, this is in the extreme of a seawater temperature of 32 degrees. So if we're in the Gulf, we've got the ambient temperature, a lot of high temperature on the external hull, we've got very warm seawater temperature. So we've got to be able to contain the liquefied gas um, for that conditions. Um, yes, in order to achieve the reduced boil off rate, we have to have thicker insulation. So if we create a thicker insulation, it reduces the volume of the cargo tank. Hence the, ta hence the ships are getting bigger. So, <clears throat> um, like I said, we're talking about, we were talking about 170 to 175,000 cubic meters. We're now up to 180. Catagas have already got some 200 um, thousand cubic meter vessels. The trouble with those is that they're 
very fine to go and extract the cargo from Qatar, but there aren't many terminals, not many receiving terminals that can take a ship that size, LNG terminals. Um, to make them cost effective, they are supposed to lift between eight and 10 cargoes a year. Uh, the current market, um, one cargo of LNG, so 170,000 cubic meters of LNG is about, any takers, how many million dollars per one cargo? 170,000 cubes? Any takers? Second? It says 20 million. Okay. Who wrote these slides? <laughs> See, he's awake. Oh, thank you. Very much. Just seeing if you're awake. Okay. Yeah. It's about. I must read these. Sandra, I must read these slides. Okay. It's about 20 million dollars a cargo. So um, you know, it's quite a big package. Thank you for reading the slides. Yes, yes, sir. I'll come to that in a minute. Yes, it's burnt and it's reliquified, depending on the consumption from the engines. I will come on to that in a minute. Good question. Hmm? Oh, come on. Okay. So quickly running through the three different types of uh, vessel. We have the moss type, which is the older style, which everybody might remember have seen uh, with the dome type tanks. Um, the trouble with these is, uh, in order to increase the capacity of the vessel, normally they're four tank, uh, to increase the capacity of the vessel, again, we're constrained by the physical size of the vessel to be able to go into a terminal. They're making uh, five tank vessels now. So this number, fit, number, number one tank is smaller than the other four. Um, the reason for that is visibility. They're bloody awful to navigate and uh, particularly in pilotage. So a um, little bit of a restriction on the size that you can build a MOS vessel. The good thing about the MOS is it's very, very strong. Um, the spheres are made of aluminium. They're made in petals, like a flower, and they join together and welded together. So we build the top hemisphere and the bottom hemisphere and you build, join them together with an equatorial ring and the sphere is suspended inside the inner hull on a skirt. So <clears throat> there's no physical contact between the aluminium sphere and the steel of the ship and the sphere itself is insulated. The trouble is that you're putting a sphere inside a cube. So you have a loss of wasted volume the cargo space around the outside of the sphere is a lot of wasted volume. Um, the good news is the aluminum tanks are extremely strong and you can take partial loading. The other type of vessels I'm going to show you, you can't take partial loading because of sloshing, very, very high sloshing. Effect. So MOS has its advantages and also its disadvantages. They're all about the same price. They all cost about uh, 120 million. Um, this is a new design. This was delivered for um, MISC, Malaysian uh, government company, um, by HHI. It is a moss vessel underneath that lovely green covering, horrible color, um, are the spheres. So it's not done for streamlining, it's done for improved insulation and actually keeping some of the cargo pipes under cover so they're not exposed so much to the elements and it reduces the boil off and so on and so forth. They're awful, terrible, terrible windage on this hull. Their maneuverability is horrendous. Um, but again, they, have, they do have their advantages. Um, I should say, most of the MOS type vessels are built in Japan, traditionally, um, HHI, Hyundai is the only shipyard in Korea that can build MOS type. The others just have never had the technology to do it. This is a little bit more information. I've spoken about most of it before. They don't need a secondary barrier. Um, I'll, I'll explain to you more a bit about the secondary barrier. Because the uh, aluminum spheres are so strong, um, all we have to do is insulate them 
and they, that is, as I said, is contained within the cargo tank area, so there's no connection between the sphere and the hull. So there's no danger of um, the inner hull of the ship getting cold, getting down to the danger levels of minus 30 where we can get cracking of the steel. So um, that's good news. Uh, high degree of safety. Um, they do have, the top of the tank is a, is a insulated layer, um, which is really weather protection. Their boil off rate um, is 0.8%, which is quite high now. Um, the cargo capacity is less than Mark III and NO96, which we'll come on to next. So this is um, a vessel uh, I built with, um, come to me in a minute. Uh, it was built in DSME uh, about five years ago. Um, it's a NO96. There are two, only two types, two patented designs for LNG. Uh, one is the Moss, which is the old Moss Rosenberg. Um, and then there's NO96 and Mark III, which is patented by GTT, French company based in Paris. Do we have any French people here today? No, we French one. Uh, we are trying to break this monopoly globally because it's not fair and it's, uh, there are better things on the market. But owners are very reluctant to try new technology when it's so expensive. So there are efforts in Korea. Korea are developing their own containment system. Uh, they developed it and it failed. <coughs> so um, we won't talk about that. It's on the list here. But anyway, um, this uh, is a very fine vessel. Um, the concept of NO96 is uh, two layers of insulation and two barriers. So we have the primary barrier, which is adjacent to the liquid, which is 0.7 mil thick invar, that one, invar. And invar is a nickel steel, which is capable of withstanding the minus 136 uh, degree cryogenic temperatures. Um, and it's patented by the French. <coughs> so, and there's only a few places in the world that are allowed to make it. Hence, it pushes up the price of the ships. So we have invar, uh, 0.7 millimeters against the liquid. Then we have a layer of insulation. Then we have another layer of invar. And we have another layer of insulation against the inner hull. So it's the primary and secondary membranes, primary and secondary insulation, like that. So the silver part is invar. It's made in strakes, um, about 30 meters long and it's uh, fusion welded. We have a lip on the edge of each plate and we have a fusion welding machine that goes along automated welding. The only bits that are manually welded at the end of each strake. And the precision welding of these guys is unbelievable. You've never seen anything like it. It's like aerospace welding, it's fantastic. Um, I won't go into a lot of detail. Okay, here we go, we do go into a bit more. Inner hull, so we think about this as a cube Outside, we've got ballast tanks, we've got double bottoms, and on the upper part, we have a trunk deck space, which is a void space. Secondary insulation. This is now polyurethane foam, like your loft insulation. Nothing more, nothing less. It used to be perlite. Perlite is a stone, very like a pumice. The trouble with perlite is it migrates. These uh, boxes are, are plywood boxes. If you put a plywood box full of little bits of stone up on its side, eventually they migrate down and it's not so effective as, as insulation over the years. So <clears throat> the expanded foam is, is much better. It keeps its form a lot better and it's got a, a higher efficiency for uh, thermal insulation. Uh, secondary membrane, like I say, is invar. Primary insulation, more rock wool primary membrane, more invar, and that's it. Very easy, <laughs> very easy. Uh, they go to together, there's around about 7,000 insulation boxes per tank, four tanks per ship. 
Each insulation box is a different shape. It's a very interesting 3D puzzle. Um, you can see there's a green label on this one here, uh, individually numbered, barcoded, uh, so that somebody knows where it's supposed to go. Um, the plywood, doesn't matter where you build your LNG ship, the plywood comes from Finland. There's a particular density, particular type of material. It doesn't have knots in it. It doesn't have, the, this is why they're so expensive. That's a finished <clears throat> NO96 tank. You can see the physical scale, the guys standing in the bottom. We have a pump tower. Obviously we have to get the liquid out somehow. So we have a pump tower with three cargo pumps on the bottom. And then in the top, right in the middle of the top, we have a gas dome. So this tank, normal sailing condition, it can be 3% full just to keep it cold. That's the heel that we can carry in a tank. Same for all Moss and Mark III tanks. Um, or 98% full. We cannot have more or less because of sloshing. We got a tidal wave in there, the ship rolling around. You can have a little bit of free surface in there and it'll damage this lovely invar and it'll smash the plywood boxes. And it's very expensive to re-scaffold this in service because the only way to get into this tank is either down this tower or through the gas dome in the middle of the very middle of the top. So um, it's quite good. Okay. Um, DSME, okay, they came up with what's called a sealed LNG. So normally we're carrying, if you increase the tank pressure, normally we carry them at 0.35 millibar. That's sufficient to maintain the liquid in its liquid state. With a certain amount of boil off on top, we've got a vapor layer. So normally we carry it at 0.35 millibar. Oh, sorry, we used to carry it at 0.275 millibar, and now we carry it at 0.35. So if you increase the pressure, it reduces the amount of boil off. Um, so they came up with this concept called sealed LNG. This is a, a, a Daewoo um, concept and a partial reliquification. So we had online, somebody said, um, do we use the gas as a fuel, the boil off gas as a fuel? Principally, yes. The concept now is that we have uh, gas burning engines, generator engines, main propulsion engines, uh, to use this boil off gas. Um, if you remember, it's about 0.15% a day of the total cargo. So that is used to propel the vessel and to um, using the generator engines. If we have more than that, more than we need, we re it, try and re it and recover it back into the cargo tank. So there's various concepts. Partial re means that we're using some of it as a fuel and some of it back to the tank. Um, but to re LNG uses energy. So it means we have to have more generators running for electrical load to do the... So there's always a trade-off. Uh, this is a Mark III, looks very similar. However, if you're a nerd like me, you can tell the difference. The Mark III forward bulkhead here facing onto the foredeck is very flat, whereas the NO96 is a little bit more pointed. Um, the problem with number one tanks in both the Mark III and the NO96 is the acceleration of the ship going through the ocean, and these ones have to be reinforced. The boxes we saw before, the plywood boxes are the strength of the containment system. So we've got this liquid sloshing around inside there. The invar doesn't have strength. The invar is the membrane. The strength is in the plywood boxes. And you can imagine the amount of acceleration that we can get and free surface effect in number one tank. Um, so they have to be particularly strong. So at the moment, HHI are building, Hyundai and Samsung are building the Mark III and also in China. It's a little bit different building concept. Uh, we don't use invar. We use all of this lot. Um, I don't like Mark III. I'm currently working on a project. The owners decided to use Mark III. With the, if you remember the invar, I told you that it's a layer of invar as a primary and a layer of invar as a secondary, um, and it's all welded together. Um, this is glue and paste. And there's so many opportunities for that not to be right. We're using this stuff called Triplex, which is basically a GRP 
uh, um, mat tape. Um, the insulation panels have triplex on the outside. Remember the last one had plywood. Um, so this I don't believe is as strong. It is when it's fully built. Um, so to create a secondary barrier, we glue the triplex, which is attached to the insulation panel, and then we have another bit of triplex and we overlap it and glue it. Just uh, anyway, it's been around for years. It's, it's really complex to make. Um, uh, anyway, they have their problems. Then the primary um, is made from this uh, stainless steel membrane, which is double corrugated. So we have horizontal strakes and and, and vertical strakes with a knuckle joint in the middle. It's very, very complicated, um, but it is stainless steel, which means we don't have to pay <coughs> the French for the invar, and we can make stainless steel pretty much anywhere, but it's very high quality. Um, it looks like that, and you can see it's extremely complex. It's corrugated in two directions to allow the thermal expansion um, and contraction and also to give it rigidity. By having the corrugation, it's obviously giving it some rigidity as well. Again, we're using plywood, um, PU foam, polyurethane foam, rigid polyurethane foam. It's a higher density. It reduces the boil off rate because it's a better insulator. Um, this is one of the tanks during construction, as I said before, for the previous type, the Mark, uh, NO96. Every panel is different. It's a major uh, task. You can see the pink labels on these. Same idea. Every single panel has got a different number. It's got a barcode on it. And um, if you put them in the wrong place, it doesn't work. It's very expensive to take them out because once they're stuck in place, you can't get them off the bulkhead. Like I said, a lot of glue and paste here. These boxes are actually stuck to the inner hull. Whereas the NO96, we use stud bolts, so you can actually take them out more easily. Um, that's the finished tank. Again, you can see the, this is actually number one tank on the vessel, so it's quite small. It's truncated going forward. Um, this is the cleaning squad um, going in afterwards, literally cleaning up any dust and dirt and anything like that before we went out on the gas trial. You can imagine just airborne particles in a shipyard, you can imagine how much crap gets into <laughs> You can see it here. It's just a kind of yellow dust. And it has to be clean before we um, go to gas trials. Um, much stronger um, because this is 1.2 millimeters thick. It's a stronger tank um, apart from this triplex bonding and gluing and stuff like that. Okay, um, how am I doing for time? Well, I'm going to let you run on. We had a panel discussion at the end, but I think the room seems to be absolutely fascinated. And uh, so let's go to which is our time for you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, fine. Um, we talked about triplex. Um, I'm going to skip through a few of these, I think. Uh, we talked about sloshing. Um, and I said to you before, we can only fill. Normal filling limit is 98.5% and 3%. We keep a certain amount of heel in the tank, 3% heel, to keep the tank cold. Uh, these are the new types that are coming into the market. They've tried it. This is a GTT idea, Mark V. It's a combination of Invar and stainless steel. But it still uses tri triplex and sticking and gluing. So uh, that hasn't worked yet. There's a, a bit of a issue with um, um, what do they call it copyright um, so they haven't actually brought that into the market yet they haven't built it um, they say that the boil off rate is better reduced boil off if you remember we saw moss is 0.8 percent boil off this is 0 0.07 so big difference um, no current orders because actually it's not licensed yet. Uh, CS1 uh, was a good idea, um, but no contract yet. Uh, KC1, this was, we really wished that this was going to work. Um, this was pushed by the Korean government. Kogas is the national um, Korean gas, surprisingly, Kogas, Korean gas. Um, made an order for two ships. They used, um, 
uh, four, four tank vessels. Two tanks were going to be the KC-1 and two tanks were the Mark III. Uh, so they made two ships. Unfortunately, the KC-1 leaks. Uh, they had big problems. They're in a big legal dispute at the moment. The ships have never sailed. The ships have never lifted a cargo. It was a disaster, actually. Everybody hoped that KC-1 would work because it would give us an alternative to using the GTT systems. GTT charge $1 million per ship license fee to the shipyard for using their design, Mark III or NO96. Hence, we're trying to get away from that. Uh, prismatic type B tanks, this is the MOS type, um, limited sloshing, much better. Uh, no current orders. Right, um, moving on quickly. This is all available afterwards, isn't it? Yeah. People can get this. Okay, so the, the concept is, as a, as a charter or an owner, you want to carry as much cargo from the loading port to the delivery port. If you reduce your boil off rate, if you have an improved boil off rate, then you're obviously getting to your delivery port with more cargo. Having said that, we like boil off because we want to use it in our engines for fuel, um, but there's a trade off. You don't want too much, otherwise, you've got to use energy to re liquefy it. And we're not allowed to vent it. So, in the event that we have too much boil off gas, we have no alternative other than to burn it in a fast gas combustion unit, which is just waste and very expensive. Um, types of propulsion, moving forward quickly, um, used to be steamships. This is what we're looking for in a propulsion system. Um, using LNG as, as a fuel, of course, you don't have any problems with NOx and SOx emissions either. So we don't need scrubbers. We only have H2O as an emissions. Um, these are the uh, eco areas, which we're, everybody will be familiar with. So in these areas, uh, we're not allowed to use heavy fuels. If we have the alternative, not just an LNG ship, but an LNG fueled vessel, change over to LNG, then you're compliant. No problem at all. You don't need a scrubber. Uh, this is the latest trend we all know about. Sulfur cap coming in. January 2020, 0.05 on the fuels. So LNG is very uh, attractive for fueling other ships other than LNG vessels. Um, what does that say? Now we have the dual fuel or tri-fuel engines. Really, really dual fuel because I would say your HFO and your MGO are liquid fuels. I, I class them as one type uh, liquid fuel. And then we have the gas fuel, which is LNG. So if they say tri-fuel, it's, it's not really. It's, it's liquid fuels and gas fuels. So dual fuel engines. Um, we have medium speed engines, which are great for generator engines. Watsilla have a very good series of them. Himson are very good. Um, and then the main engines, we've got MAN and Watsilla as the mains. It's a bit of a funny graph this, I made this up because I couldn't find anything. Um, going back to the old previous uh, LNGs, of course they're all steam. Very easy to burn gas in a boiler. It's very easy. You just change it over from fuel and you have a gas burner. And it's very efficient because the energy from gas is much higher than liquid fuel. So you get a lot of steam for a very small amount of fuel. Um, but Boilers are not efficient, even if you use economizers, etc. So they really came to an end. And nobody's building steam propel uh, ships anymore, even LNG fueled, and they disappeared uh, in uh, phased out around about 2010. And then the um, the DFDE engines, dual fuel diesel electric engines came in. Concept being generator engines dual fueled, can be run on gas, big generator sets, electric propulsion motors. Very nice concept, not super efficient because of the electrical losses. Um, a lot more could be done on that and I think it's gonna come back. A lot of thyristor to control and, and, and low temperatures and things like this. I think that will come back. Um, then there was a blip, the MEGI engines, Marine Engines Gas Injection. Gas injection is, uh, not nice. Um, these are the MAN engines. They use gas at 310 bar in the engine room. 
we don't like that. The crew don't like that. I build the ships, but I would never sail on them. <sighs> all the class societies and all the clever people have does, done hazards and has ops, and they say, it's okay, it's a double wall pipe, and we've got gas detection and everything like that. But the crew want to do maintenance on the gas system, they go, phone MAN, <laughs> don't touch. So it's, uh, it, they, they, they came and they went, they're very efficient, very efficient. Um, but people just don't like the concept. In order to get your gas up to 310 bar, you have to have other equipment, compressors and such like, uh, which is auxiliary equipment, which has a very high capex. So in order to build these ships, quite high price and ongoing maintenance costs, OPEX as well. So the latest design is XDF. Um, MAN and Wartzilla uh, became one company a few years ago. Uh, Mr. Diesel and Mr. Otto would be very disgusted at this if you know about the history of these things. Um, the good news, in some ways, good news, uh, in order for technology to advance, uh, the Chinese bought a part of Wartzilla and now own the rights for XDF, which is the low pressure fuel engines. Um, which is great because they only operate at seven bar and everybody's happy with that. And that's what we're building now. Um, there are still a few MEGI engines around. The benefit of the MEGI engines was, uh, going to all this, uh, methane slip. They don't have methane slip. Methane slip is there's a certain amount of unburnt gas in the cylinder. Um, compression ignition engine, gas gets injected, compression, supposed to burn, explode and burn all. It doesn't always burn all because it's low pressure injection. But the XDF engines are the next generation and they're much more efficient. The point of methane slip, what we don't want is to have any LNG, methane, left in the exhaust. Because as I said to you before, it's a greenhouse gas and it's going to go up the exhaust and we're trying to use a clean fuel and we don't want to create a greenhouse gas. Okay, steam propulsion mentioned that. Chinese are still looking at ultra steam turbines. It may come back in. Um, steam is very easy. Uh, steam turbines are very simple. Um, like I said, uh, Japanese ships are quite expensive to build, but they're looking at this technology. It may, it may come back, I don't know. Um, they're using reheat intermediate pressure turbines. I'll flick through these. Told you about DFDE. This is the electrical uh, G diesel engines running electrical propulsion, very simple. Dual fuel generator engines, um, gas supply, liquid fuel supply, very, very simple. And then we have propulsion motors. Okay, uh, MEGI, these are this lovely 300 bar in the engine room, very scary. Like anyway, we're not doing that anymore. Um, move on. XDF. This is where we are now. It was 15 bar originally, but they found that they can get the efficiency in in the lean burn, um, and it's now down to somewhere between seven and 10 bar. So it's pretty safe, and it's still double walled pipes. It's very clear, very very safe. Um, this is quite interesting. The efficiency of uh, the engines. If you look at the amount of boil off gas, which is natural boil off, which comes from the ambient pressure temperature and ambient temperature at the time you're sailing, you get a certain amount of natural boil off gas, which is this red line. It varies depending on um, the type of containment system we use. And then we have the consumption of fuel that we need for our engine. So at some point we reach a balance between natural boil off gas and the normal steaming speed of the vessels. Normally these LNGs cruise around in the laden condition around about 17 to 18 knots, 19 knots, something like that. So we need to have the right amount of boil off gas. We don't really want to reliquify it because we've got uh, energy in order to do that. So do you look at the efficiency here? The steam turbine is using 140 tons a day, whereas the uh, XDF engine is just on the line now, it's down to 85 tons. The consequence of the steam turbine, which is off the graph, means that we have to force LNG 
we actually have to use more LNG than the natural boil off to consume in our boilers. So the boilers, the steam system is very inefficient. So you can see that the XDF has now come down below the line. So it's kind of matching the natural boil off. Uh, quite an interesting graph we said about NOx and SOx. Back to our emissions, you've got CO2, NOx and SOx. This is the um, emissions reduction by switching to gas. So big, big, big difference. And no particulates. We don't get any carbon when we're building, running on gas. Um, I'm going to move through these. Co-gas we talked about. Uh, Reliquification technology and trends. Again, if we get too much boil off gas, then we can use as a fuel. We don't want to burn it. Uh, and we have various ways to turn it back into a liquid, but of course that uses energy, which normally means when we're sailing, we're normally running with one generator running what, for electrical sea load. If we have a reliquification plant, then we've got to run another generator. So the whole energy curve goes up. But the value of the LNG at the end is, is obviously high value. Um, so we can take natural boil off gas from our tanks. These are meant to be ship's tanks. Uh, it comes off, it goes through a boil off gas compressor, and then it goes through some form of cooling. Um, I've got nitrogen cooling here. Nitrogen temperature liquefied state, anybody? Minus 60 something, 58, 60 degrees, minus 50, something like that. But we're trying to, so this is only gonna be a heat exchanger. So the liquefied gas is minus 163. The vapors coming off is 164. <laughs> um, and it's going down here. So the efficiency of trying to cool it down, you can't get a refrigeration plant to take it liquid, the, the gas back down to 162. So you're only returning a, a small amount back. It's not efficient cycle at all. Um, what we want to do is use most of it in the main engine and generators. Uh, and what's left over, we want to return back using energy, getting it back into the cargo tanks. And what we do not want to use this year, we call it GCU, gas combustion unit. We do not want to use that because it's just going to atmosphere. Okay, um, we've already said a little bit about the current trends. Again, you can see here the prediction that um, by mid 20, 2020, 2035, more LNG will be carried by C than it is by pipeline, as we said before, which is good. That's the same map that we had before. You can see the trends. Uh, world energy trends. Again, you can see that LNG is probably already overtaking coal and oil is diminishing. So LNG is the fuel of the future. Um, we touched on some other areas. We talked about the supply chain. Um, Quite a lot going on in Mozambique at the moment. Um, right, yeah, about 140 million tons per year from the current. And supply is 2020 will be 57% greater than 2015. So you can see how LNG is becoming more popular and more extraction as well. Uh, demand, again, uh, it's very good for evolving countries. Uh, evolving economies. Um, you can have a floating offshore power station or you can have a floating offshore storage unit. You don't need to make a, a tank farm on the shore side. Um, so it's very efficient. Uh, all you do is to get your floating offshore power station, you run your cables to your shore, you plug them into your shoreside grid, and then you just need LNG feeder ships to come in and give you uh, power supply to your country. So this is very attractive. This is happening in many countries around the world at the moment, about five or six projects going on. Uh, demand, of course, we talked about container ships. Uh, CMA, CGM are great advocates of LNG fueled vessels. They were the first to have them. Many other companies are following on. Um, and I said to you right at the beginning, there is a shortage of bunker vessels. That's a tote, but it's it's a similar CMA CGM. We've got LNG fueled VLCCs. We've got uh, ferries, uh, passenger vessels. Um, 
so LNG as a bunker is the future. There aren't enough bunker vessels and there aren't enough bunker stations in the world yet. Um, cruise ships, very similar. That's it, ladies and gentlemen. <sighs> Any questions? <laughs> Deathly silence. Okay. Um, do do some of these dual fuel engines need um, a diesel pre ignition system? Or yeah, so there will be some. Yeah. The current generation of engines um, use a pilot fuel. Uh, they're very long stroke, slow speed engines. Uh, the gas comes in through, uh, they call them gas valves, but it's and to all intents and purposes, it's a, a, a gas injector at the bottom of the stroke, just above the exhaust ports. So the gas comes in, and as, it's, as the gas is getting compressed, as the piston's moving up, there's a very, very small fuel injection to initiate combustion. Gas, does, gas isn't good at compression ignition, so we need a pilot fuel to make it. Okay. That's the difference between the MEGI engines injecting under pressure and then they manage to get compression ignition but on the xdf engines we use a pilot fuel very very small percentage very tiny yes 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 exactly that yep This is more of an endorsement than a question. I live in Malta and some years ago um, our government changed over our power station from oil to LNG and they used to ship moored off and then brought it ashore and it cut our electricity bills in half. Any more questions? Yes, okay, hang on. I'm, I'm not sure how many IMCA accredited LNG surveyors there are, but I'm, I'm, fully, I'm fully aware that the LNG accreditation within IMCA is towards the fueling, not the vessel. So how is there any training possibilities apart from the owners, managers who trains their own crew to participate and how is IMCA? looking into any training accreditation towards getting that uh, implemented for us surveyors, which may not as me getting old, but the younger ones, which needs to see the trend and getting that accreditation. That's just a baby. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, I, I was just going to say, it might be also something that IMS and, uh, might be interested in doing anyway, in developing some training, so. Okay. Um, to be absolutely honest, there aren't enough people LNG qualified in the world at the moment. There are not enough crews sailing, if you think of Katagas just ordering 100 ships. So 100 ships needs 200 crews. <laughs> you've, got to, you've got to have them back to back, right? Yeah. doing something about this in Sweden, and they even struggling with crew training and crew What we're trying to do now, there isn't, if you've got a tanker endorsement as an engineer, for example, um, there are ways to cross train, but you have to physically sail on an LNG as a supernumerary to get the minimum of six months sea time before you can go and do your gas endorsement. So the, like, the oil majors, the Shells and the BPs and TK, um, have built their vessels with this in mind with additional uh, accommodation um, and training facilities on board. Um, other owners are not doing that and are poaching from the market and if you 
have an LNG endorsement now, you can name your price if you're an officer and you want to sail on a new LNG. You sail on that one for a couple of years and another owner pops up and they're looking for a crew and then you, and the salaries are going up again. Yeah. I was more looking into it's a big because that fuel will also come in to offshore vessels. Yeah. Or any other vessels which we are accredited to do. Yeah. But which we are not fully competent, although we have seen LNG fuels, we are not fully competent as the ABI to be accredited to go and have a look at these things. I don't think there is any accreditation yet. No. All I but can say. But part of the ABI already are we LNG. It, it's it's one of those things, isn't it? We were talking about autonomous vessels and so on, and I was talking to um, somebody the other day who said the trouble is with autonomous vessels is they're out there and they're going to be at sea. Law hasn't caught up. It was written the law. So what happens when two of these vessels collide? It is a bit like that. So you've got technology at the moment, which I think is running faster than actually we can keep up with it. And uh, well, that's a challenge. It's not just a challenge in the marine world. It, it, it's in many, many sectors. But is that a fair comment? Yeah. I mean, all, I can, all I can say is, all you can, there's two reference books, ITC code and the IGN code. And that's, yeah. that's it. Yeah. As far as training is concerned, um, not much. Well, I participated in one of the trainings held by some of the Domsdale workers this week because they have those same size hangers running on LNG, so I participated in that together with the crews. Yeah. That may not necessarily be enough to get an LNG accreditation within the yeah. Just <laughs> think, think of a passenger ship. We're now yeah. going on to dual, dual, fuel, dual yeah. fuel engines. The crew, not just sailing on a, on, a, on, a, on a ferry, they have to be LNG certified. Yeah. LNG is a fuel. Yeah. I'm, I'm not so worried about but it's moment, how are you going to inspect them? Absolutely. It's coming technology. Yeah. It's coming. Yeah. 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 You start to see the technology. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Right, thank you, everybody. So opportunity um, for some future training. Courses. Peter, can I? Yes. <laughs> future training courses. There's a box there for you and one for Sandra. Oh, so well. much. Thank, thank you, you very, very much. much indeed. Thank um, you. An absolute masterclass in LNG. Thank you very much. <laughs>